Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to week five of our Bible Read Along, and this is your introduction to week five of the New Testament. So we're still in Matthew, and if it feels like you're not making progress, remember, this is one of the three longest books in the New Testament. Some of them are super short. I hope you're beginning to see how the story of Jesus fits together and how, how the recurring patterns of the story help us understand who Jesus is and what he does. Now, in this week's readings, we're going to move into the part of the story that happens in Jerusalem as Jesus is approaching the time of his death. This is sometimes called the passion narrative, passion from the Latin word for suffering. It doesn't have anything to do with strong feeling, though it's going to evoke a lot of strong feeling for sure. This is where the story has been headed from the beginning. There were hints at the beginning that we kind of pointed out, and now it's it's headed headed towards this grand conclusion. So there's a lot of amazing stuff that's going to be happening in these chapters. You're going to see the rich ruler as you begin reading in, in the middle of chapter 19 this week. This man believes he can do God a favor. He says to Jesus, what good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? Like, I'm going to make a trade with God. Jesus says, no one's good, but God, that should rule the man out. And people say, oh, Jesus doesn't think he's God. Well, notice, you know, he continues to answer the question. So Jesus is, is willing to accept the role of God, though he is calling the, the man's attention to this. Does it in a subtle way, as Jesus always does. Well, the man doesn't take any hints. He says, you know, well, you know, what, what Jesus says to him, keep the law. And the man says, oh, I've done that. Well, you know, if he's read the law, well, he'd know he hasn't done that. His ancestors didn't do it. He hasn't done it. People are bad at law keeping. He should be coming to God for mercy, not for a trade. So ultimately, Jesus says, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Not meaning you'll have payoff at the end, merely, but God will take care of you. God in heaven will take care of you. You see, the man's problem is self-sufficiency, and it is his wealth that gives him the illusion of self-sufficiency. This is why when the man goes away sad and doesn't listen to Jesus, who says at the end of this, follow me, by the way, very important. Jesus says, you know, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. In other words, impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God can save us if we just give up our self-sufficiency. Well, the disciples have the same problem. They say, listen, we left everything for you. And Jesus says, oh, God's going to give you many times more than what you've given up. You know, this is not a transaction. The workers in the vineyard are going to tell us that story. Some will work a short time. Some will work all day. The master gives them all the same thing. Some of them object. Don't object. God is gracious. He is generous. It's about his generosity. The mother of James and John wants them to have the prominent places in God's kingdom. And Jesus reminds all of them he's going to his death. They have trouble hearing that. They don't understand. And that means the greatest among you will be the servant because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Now we'll meet some blind men. They know they have a need. They don't offer a trade. They just say, have mercy on us. And we want to see. Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem. He's going to be hailed as king while he is there. People are going to quote from the 118th Psalm saying, this is our, our king, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus then is going to go into the temple and in a famous action, cleanse the temple. But what he's really saying is contained in the statement, you've made it a den of robbers. Now, in saying that, he's actually quoting from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, who used that to explain why God was going to let the temple fall into the hands of the Babylonians and be destroyed. Jesus is warning the temple leaders who are rejecting him, who are going to take him to his death, that they are rejecting the one whom God has sent. And so God is going to bring a sign of judgment on them in the form of the destruction of the temple that would come a generation later. They're going to question Jesus' authority, and he's going to point out obedience isn't just hearing, but doing. But in that, he's also going to point out how they are disobedient in that they are rejecting the son that God has sent to his vineyard to, to establish his rule over his people. And so Jesus is going to say, you know, I am even greater than David's son. Yes, I'm David's son, but I'm even greater than that. I am the Lord 
to whom David bows. So in all of this, we're seeing Jesus revealing himself, but in a way that's challenging everyone who is listening to reevaluate their loyalties, their assumptions, to put aside the idea that God is going to establish his rule by doing power the way you know the other kingdoms do. No, God is going to establish his rule by means of Jesus going to the cross. And that, as we like to say, changes everything. Okay, happy reading. And as we read, let's accept the challenge to, to be like Jesus, to serve others in the name of Jesus.